بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Today, inshallah, we are going to learn something about the narration of Malikuddar, which some Sufis try to provide that narration as the proof of grave worshipping, asking something from dead. So we will try to do some investigation and, and examination about this rivaya or narration, inshallah. And on the basis of uh, this narration, some people have accused Shaykh Allama Abdul Aziz bin Baz rahimahullah of calling a Sahabi or a Sahabi Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa as mushrik or doing shirkiya act on the basis of this narration. They have accused Shaykh Allama bin Baz rahimahullah. So we will try to check the authenticity of this narration. We will try to check the people in this narration, whether they are thika, the reliable, the trustworthy people. And we will try to check whether this narration is contradicting the other more reliable and more trustworthy texts of Quran and Sahih Hadith. First of all, let's very quickly check the narration. The narration is something like this, that the people suffered a drought during the time of Umar anhu's khilafa, whereupon a man came to the grave of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and said, O Messenger of Allah, ask for rain for your community, for verily they have but perished. After which the Prophet wasallam appeared to him in his dream and told him, Go to Umar anhu, then tell him to do istisqa, that is ask Allah for rain for the people and that they will be watered and tell him you must be clever, you must be clever. So the man went and told Umar anhu, and Umar anhu cried and said, O my Lord, I spare no effort except in what escapes my power. And in this uh, narration, we have four people in the chain. That is Abu Muawiyah, Amash, Abi Saleh, Al-Zakwan As-Samman and Malik Uddar. First of all, let's see what is the meaning of Athar. This is Athar. The chain is not going till Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The Athar is something which does not go till Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Athar is something which is a call or fail, an action or the speech or the saying of a Sahabi, a Tabai or a Taba Tabai. So this is the difference between Athar and a Hadith. Hadith, it directly, the chain directly goes to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the chain of the Athar is still Sahabi. Now let's check very quickly the authenticity of this Athar. Allama Albani said, Firstly, we do not accept that this story is authentic since the reliability of precision of Malikuddar is not known. And these are the two principal conditions necessary for the authenticity of any narration. As is affirmed in the science of Hadith, Ibn Abi Hatim mentioned in Jarhawa Tadil and does not mention anyone who narrates from him except Abu Saleh. So this indicates that he is unknown. And this is further emphasized by the fact that Ibn Abi Hatim himself, who is well known for his memorization and wide knowledge, did not quote anyone who declared him reliable. So he remains unknown. Hafiz Ibn Hajar mentioned the last part of the Sanad, the chain of the narrators, and skipped Amash because he knew when Amash narrates with An, then it's not accepted. Then why Imam Rahimahullah has mentioned this Athar? In Fatul Bari, 
because he has used this narration as a supporting narration for Abbas radiallahu anhu's narration for istisqa. So this is the beauty and this is the way of uh, muhaddithun uh, when they use some part of some weak narration and some part of s- some weak chain of the narration to support the original reliable narration then we have to take that part only not consider the whole of that weak narration because that particular part of the narration is supporting the original and authentic narration which is more reliable so in this chapter of istisqa in fathul bari imam hafiz ibn hajar has mentioned this narration he is not proving the matter of istighatha from this athar rather he is using it to support the original riwayah of abbas radiyallahu anhu regarding istisqa not istighatha we have to take in consideration that under which chapter muhaddithin has used that particular narration so that also explains the meaning of that narration hafiz ibn hajar rahimahullah did not provide a complete chain because he wanted to draw attention to the fact that there was something requiring investigation in it the scholars say this for various reasons so what they would rather do in such a case is to quote a part requiring further examination which is what al hafiz rahimahullah did here it is also as if he indicates that the fact abu saleh as samman is alone in reporting from malik uddar or that he is unknown and allah knows best so this is a very fine point of knowledge which will be realized only by those having experience in this field what we have said is also aided by the fact that Hafiz Al-Mundhiri reports another story from the narration of Malik Uddar from Umar in At-Targhib and says after it At-Tabarani reports it in Al-Kabir its narrators up to Malik Uddar are famous and reliable but as for Malik Uddar then I do not know him this is a statement of Imam At-Tabarani quoted by Imam Hafiz Al-Mundhiri in Targhib volume number 2 page number 41 to 42 The same is said by Haythami in Majmu'z Zawaid volume number 3 There is discontinuance between Abu Saleh Dhaqwan As-Samman and Malik Uddar There is no justification for the soundness of this tradition because it entirely depends upon a person whose name has not been spelled out only in the tradition narrated by Saif bin Umar Tamimi he has been named Bilal and Saif has declared him as a weak narrator The credibility and memory of Malik Uddar is not known and these are the two basic criteria for any authentic narrator of tradition. Ibn Abu Hatim Ar-Razi in Kitab Al-Jarh wa Ta'dil while discussing Malik Uddar has not mentioned any narrator except Abu Saleh who has accepted any tradition from him which shows that he is unknown. It is also supported by the fact that Ibn Abu Hatim Ar-Razi who himself is a leading figure of Islam and a memorizer of traditions has not mentioned any one of them who has pronounced him trustworthy thiqah similarly mundhiri has remarked that he does not know him while hathami in his majmu zawaid has supported his observation now let's see something about the misunderstanding and misinterpretations about this author some people take this author to defend their deviant creed of grave worshiping and try to prove their wrong aqidah of asking from death or asking from dead people asking from graves but alhamdulillah this athar is not sufficient to prove anything in islam now we will see what imams of hadith that is muhaddithun and the other imams understood this hadith to mean as per ibn hajar asqalani this hadith is the evidence of being obedient of the ruler or imam or anyone who is authority upon you so the meaning which is understood by muhaddithun and aima of earlier time is that this athar is the proof of obedience towards the ruler and it does not prove the grave worshiping asking from dead hafiz ibn hajar al asqalani rahimahullah in his book fathul bari he cites in a chapter the people asking the imam to do istisqa in times of drought 
it's clear from the chapter of uh, Hafiz ibn Hajar that the meaning of this athar is not something which Sufis take but the meaning is we can use this athar to prove that people should ask Imam or Khalifa or ruler to do istisqa in the times of no rain. In the chapter heading section in which he quotes a hadith that have relevance to the chapter heading and that connect it with hadith that comes under that chapter. Amongst those narrations he mentions the narration of Malik Uddar and he only quotes the part of the narration. He stops at go to Umar. He used this as an evidence that people ask the Imam to do istisqa, ask for the rain for them in the times of drought. He didn't mention the rest of the hadith because it has nothing to do with the chapter heading. He only quoted what he believed fits the chapter title. For he says at the end of the section after mentioning this narration, from all of these appears to relevance of the chapter heading to the origin of this story. So Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar rahimahullah, understood from this hadith that the Prophet wasallam was directing the man to go ask the Imam to do istisqa for them. Al-Hafidh ibn Kathir rahimahullah, he cites it in the book Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya in which he mentions some narrations right before he mentions Malik Uddar's narration that explains the meaning of the narration. The narrations before it are by Saif ibn Umar and in them is the mentioning of the Umar radiallahu anhu after hearing about the man's dream who is said to be Bilal ibn al-Harith al-Muzani asking the people on the member if they have seen anything bad from him and then he tells them about the dream that the Bilal saw so they told him Bilal has spoken the truth so make istisqa so then Umar does istisqa through Al Abbas and in the second narration they said he found you slow in doing istisqa so do istisqa for us so he did these two narrations could be weak but the point is that Al Hafidh ibn Kathir rahimahullah has mentioned them right before the narration of Malikudda, showing what it is about and what does it mean which shows that he understood it to mean same as what Hafiz ibn Hajar rahimahullah understood from it and the general ruling is no one from the Salaf has aqidah of asking dead people to ask Allah for rain now we will see something about who is Malikuddar before we see the status of Malikuddar let's first very quickly see the five conditions which are required for the hadith to be accepted with muhaddithin. The very first condition is al-adala means reliability and trustworthiness of the narrators. Number two, tamam al their memory power, hafidah. Number three, ittisal sanad the chain of the narrators should be connected. There should not be any break in the chain of the narrators. Number four, admu shudud the narration should not be shad. Shad means a person narrating something which is against the narration of the more reliable and trustworthy person. In other words, we can say shad means less trustworthy person is contradicting the more trustworthy person. For example, a tabi'i is saying something which is contradictory with a sahabi. So this should not be the case in the narration that a person narrating something which is against or contradictory to the person who is more trustworthy in front of him. So this is shad, shudud. Number fifth condition, admul illa. There should not be any illat, any disease in the narration and the disease can be pointed out by the experts. The muhaddithin. A common man cannot find out the disease illa in the narration. Now let's say something about who is Malik Uddar. Some people and ulama from the later generation have misunderstood and said that Malik Uddar is a sahabi. But no one from the early generations of Islam has considered him as sahabi. But they have considered him as tabi'i. From later generations Imma, like Imam al Zahabi, has mentioned him in his book as Sahabi. Hence, some people thought that since Imma have mentioned him as Sahabi, so he is a Sahabi. But it's not fact. Why? Because majority of early generations, Muhaddithin 
and scholars also majority of later generations muhaddithin and scholars have considered him as tabi'i and not sahabi like imam ibn hibban said he is thiqah reliable for taking hadith no other muhaddith called him thiqah calling a person thiqah means the person is non sahabi because no muhaddith called sahabi as thiqah because it is consensus that all the sahaba are thiqah as sahabatu kulluhum udul wa suduq and the people who are aware of ilm al hadith knows that all the muhaddithin consider ibn hibban's tawthiq of majhul is a majruh qal and not a rajih qal when imam ibn hibban does tawthiq of some majhul rawi majhul narrator then this qal of imam ibn hibban is majruh qal imam bukhari and imam abi hatim al razi remained silent for malik ud dar they did sukut and the principle is that when these two aima do sukut on someone means the rabi or the narrator is not thiqa why because imam ar razi himself said in jarhawa tadil that whenever i mention the name of someone a some a narrator and do sukut then he is consider that he is not thiqa with me with imam ibn abu hatim he is majhul al hal means he knows the person as a person but he is not aware about the reliability for taking hadith from him imam bukhari has not taken a single hadith from malik ud dar in his bukhari sharif not only this not a single riwayat of Ma- malik ud dar is present in all the six major books of hadith siha sitta imam ahmad ibn hanbal has not mentioned a single hadith in his musnad from malik ud dar similarly imam malik in his muatta has not mentioned a single hadith from malik ud dar similarly imam ad darimi in his sunan has not taken a single hadith from malik ud dar why because he is majhul ul hal for all these ahimma similarly malik ud dar is majhul ul hal with so many muhaddithin majhul means they know him as a person but does not know his reliability of taking hadith whether he is he was good in hafiza memory etc hafiz ibn hajar has mentioned him under al mukhadramin means the people who were present in the era of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but could not get a chance to meet prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam hence they are not a sahabi many people have misunderstood that since hafiz ibn hajar has mentioned him in his book so he is a sahabi but this is not right this is not the case the correct view is that he is a tabi'i Imam Az-Zahabi is upon ijtihad that Malik ud-Dar is Sahabi. He did guman or qiyas that since Malik ud-Dar has taken narrations from Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu hence he might have met Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the <coughs> ijtihad of, of Imam Az-Zahabi is depend upon might have. He is not sure. He is just guessing and uh, because there is not much difference in the date of death between Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Abu Bakr. Hence Imam Az-Zahabi has done guessing that he might have met Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. No one knows when Malik ud-Dar died. there is an uncertainty about meeting of abi saleh as saman with malik ud dar these are also two major problems in that hadith malik ud dar's death period is not known and investigations or examinations prove that no one can say with surety that abi saleh as saman has met malik ud dar so seems that the ittisal us sanad the connectivity of chain is also not there in this hadith The other objections people raise about this author is since Umar radhiyallahu anhu has appointed Malik ud-Dar as a treasurer is it not the reason enough that he is a thiqah the answer is no it is not the reason enough because thiqah has two meanings one is worldly meaning and one one is the meaning with muhaddithin in terms of taking hadith one meaning is that he may be reliable or trustworthy in the worldly matters muamalat but in the field of the science of hadith thiqah means 
العدل والتام الضبط as far as عدل is concerned okay we can say he is عدل but محدثين are unaware about his memory power which is required to be a thiqah rawi Imam Ibn Hibban said since his ustad and his student is thiqah then he should be thiqah this is an opinion of Imam Ibn Hibban but it does not look a strong opinion as compared to the other Imam's opinion because he is doing guessing by looking at the tawseeq of the teacher and the student Okay, now we will say something about was the strange man Bilal ibn al-Harith al-Muzani? Some people try hard to prove that the strange man who saw Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his dream was Bilal ibn al-Harith al-Muzani. The fact is that there is no authentic narration which proves that this man was Bilal al-Muzani. <coughs> Apart from Saif ibn Umar, no one else has claimed. That this man was Bilal ibn al Haris al Muzani. And it is well known that Saif is unreliable and zindiq. Bilal ibn al Harith is buried from this Shirkiya act. Alhamdulillah. Now, to understand why Saif is not reliable, we will have to understand the difference between history of Islam versus the authentic text of Quran and Sunnah. So, on one side we have history of Islam, which is contaminated with weak narrations, which is contaminated with unreliable narration, untrustworthy narrations. And some narrations are objectionable by muhaddithin and early generations of scholars, the top scholars. And on the other side we have the authentic text of Quran and Sunnah, which is 100% true and correct. Everyone has consensus about text of Quran and Sunnah. So sometimes we see that the text of Islamic history and the authentic text of Quran and Sunnah contradicts each other. For example, we see as per the Islamic history, there was a lot of disagreement between Sahaba Karam. But on the other hand, the authentic text of Quran and Sunnah praises companions of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as being of on the highest rank after Ambiya and confirmed that they all will go to paradise. So are we going to do tahqir of Sahaba based on the history of Islam or are we going to consider them as highest rank as per the authentic text of Quran and Sunnah? So we come to a conclusion that anything from the Islamic history is going to contradict with the authentic text of Quran and Sunnah, then we will take into consideration the authentic text of Sharia and we will ignore the history of Islam, which is contaminated with non-reliable narrations, also some weak narrations and some narrations are such that ulama and muhaddithin have disagreements with those narrations. The same is the case here. On one side, Muhaddithin are agreed that Saif ibn Umar is weak and we should not take narrations from him. He is a historian. His narrations cannot make any impact over the fundaments of Quran and Sunnah such as Aqeedah. On the other hand, we have many texts of Quran and authentic hadith which denies going to the grave and taking them as a wasila. One of the very famous verse from the Quran, Surah Al-Zumar, chapter number 39 and the verse number 3, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Wal-lazina attakhadu min dunihi awliya ma na'buduhum illa liyuqarribuna ila Allahi zulfa inna allaha يَحْكُمُ بَيْنَهُمْ فِي مَا هُمْ فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ And those who take protectors besides Allah say that we only worship them that they may bring us nearer to Allah in position. Indeed, Allah will judge between them concerning that or which they differ. Again, in, in Surah Az-Zumar, Chapter 39, verse 43, Allah has condemned and rejected the wrong types of wasila. This ayah is answer to those who say we are not asking dead people directly but we are asking Allah through dead people. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Amit takhadhu min dunillahi shufa'a qul awalaw kanu la yamlikuna shay'an wa la ya'qilun. Or have they taken other than Allah as intercessors? 
say even though they do not possess power over anything nor they have any intellect in the explanation of this verse of quran mufassirin said that allah is denying to take non living things as wasila like dead people stones trees amulets etc these verses of the quran is also the reply to those who say there is nothing wrong in taking graves as intercessors Aisha radhiyallahu anha and Abdullah ibn Abbas said when death approached the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he started to cover his face with a cloak of his when he became distressed he lifted it from his face and said may Allah curse the Jews and the Christians for they have taken the graves of their prophets as a place of worship the narrator said he was warning against doing what they did This is authentic narration mentioned in Sahih Bukhari 425 and Muslim 531. In this hadith we can clearly see that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbade us to do any activity related to ibadah on the grave. And dua is also ibadah. Except making dua to Allah for the maghfira and rahma for the grave. Not a single authentic text of Quran and Sunnah exists which proves asking something to the grave or asking Allah through the dead person. There is one more hadith in which Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "O oh Allah, do not make my grave an idol to be worshipped after me." Allah was very angry with those people who took the graves of their prophets as a place of worship. Imam Malik has mentioned this hadith in his Muwatta at 593. In another Sahih hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Do not sit on graves and do not pray facing them." Narrated by Muslim 972. Since a Muslim is not allowed to face the grave while prayer how can it be allowed to make dua to grave to ask Allah for the rain and this entire section whatever we have mentioned just now starting from the difference of the history of Islam and authentic text of Quran and Sunnah till to ayah of Quran and three hadith this entire section is uh, also the proof that taking dead people as an intercession is against Quran and Sunnah and ijma of sahaba taking graves as wasila is one of the serious matter of aqida and it may lead to shirk hence we need to have a strong and clear evidences to prove that we can do tawassul via graves we can't take the historical weak narrations to prove any matter related to aqida So this was the answer for the question that where is the ijma and where is other authentic narrations or other nusus which proves that this particular narration of Malik ud-Dar is against the ijma of sahaba this is the ijma of sahaba now let's see something about who was Saif ibn Umar some people claim that we did not get this narration from Saif He is just informing us about the man who saw Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his dream. Answer to this claim is since we agree that Saif is informing us about the identity of unknown person. We will see that why we cannot consider Saif's claim that this unknown man was Bilal ibn al-Harith al-Muzni radhiyallahu anhu. Sarfraz Khan quoted a Samhudi in his Taskin al-Sudur that the man who saw Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his dream in the hadith of Malik ud-Dar ibn al-Harith al-Muzni from the narration of Saif ibn al-Umar in his Futuh Sheikh Muhammad al-Deobandi answered in his Aina Taskin al-Sudur Look at the state of this in light of the sayings of Imam Al-Jarrah wa Ta'dil. Abbas said from Yahya ibn Ma'in rahimahullah that he is weak. Mutin narrated from Yahya there is no good from him. Abu Da'ud said he is nothing, laysa bi shay. Abu Hatim Ar-Razi said matruk, abandoned. Ibn Hibban said accused of being zindiq, the heretic. Ibn Adi and Saif 
would fabricate hadith and he was accused of being a zindiq mizan al-itidal saif is the author of the book al-futuh and he is a weak by agreement faiz al-bari chapter time of the fajr volume 2 page 136 Saif ibn Umar accused of being zindiq and fabricating hadith reference Tanzih al-Shari'ah al-Marfu'ah of Abdul Hasan Ali ibn al-Muhammad Saif is matruk he was accused of fabricating and being a zindiq ibn Adi said the majority of the of his hadith are munkar we are providing the references below in the description inshallah Al-Dhahabi said Saif ibn Umar he was like Al-Waqidi he narrated from Hisham ibn Urwa and Ubaidillah ibn Al-Amr Jabir Al-Jughfi and from a lot of unknown narrators Mizan al-Itadal volume 2 page 255 Saif ibn Umar was reporting fabrications from trustworthy people and he was fabricating hadith Kitab al-Majruhin of Ibn Hibban volume 1 page 345 to 346 Saif ibn Umar matruk by agreement and ibn hibban said he was reporting fabrications al mughni of az zahabi volume 1 page 292 tahdib at tahdib volume 4 page 295 what is strangeness and thousands of regrets that people of knowledge like maulana muhammad safraz khan take from this kind of zindiq without any religion a fabricator of hadith a liar like waqidi that this man was bilal ibn al harith Al Muzani and this was the end of the Sheikh Muhammad's words Then Sheikh Muhammad concluded that the answer to Ustad Nailvi was not correct there is no authentic isnad in the world saying any sahabi ever did that and the challenge of an Nailvi remains then on page 190 Sheikh Muhammad quoted from the teacher of Sarfraz Khan Maulana Hussain Ali Al Hanafi from his Tafsir Be Nadir page 52 Polytheist people say scholars sought help from the grave of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and were helped the answer is this is from lies and what is in this story nobody does it except polytheist people Al Baihaqi and Ibn Abi Shaiba narrated that drought reached at the time of Umar radiyallahu anhu then the answer is that this man is not among the sahaba of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam rather he is a majhul al hal and majhul of name and its sanad is not known to be authentic and in the narration naming this man going to the grave as bilal ibn al harith al muzani then the answer is that there is in the sanad saif ibn umar adhabi and he is agreed upon to be weak and accused of being zindiq okay now there is a very silly objection raised about this author that where in the hadith it is written that we cannot take wasila of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the answer to this is imam alusi said a great number of scholars have considered this to be a shirk to ask with wasila of dead people narration of this unknown man is opposing the silent consensus ijma us sukuti of sahaba karam radhiyallahu anhu as for seeking rain they did not do this istishfa on the grave rather turned to abbas radhiyallahu anhu and umar radhiyallahu anhu told the difference in tawassul between before when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is alive and after his death the statement of umar that in the life of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a dalil as the answer to this objection that where in the hadith of abbas radhiyallahu anhu it is written that we cannot take wasila of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's grave the statement of umar radhiyallahu anhu that o oh allah we used to ask prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was alive for doing istisqa for us and now we take abbas radhiyallahu anhu his uncle as wasila to ask for us rain to you this statement of umar radhiyallahu anhu is the proof that we should not take prophet's grave as wasila we can consider this concept with a very simple example that for example when your father was alive there was miskin there was a faqir used to come and ask your father 
for some money and your father used to give him money and now when your father has passed away that miskin or faqir is coming to you and asking you that o oh, fulan ibn fulan i used to come when your father was alive and i used to ask him for 1000 bucks and he used to give me now since your father is not alive i question you this example proves that his father is not having qudra to give him 1000 bucks his father cannot give him that's why he is asking to you this example is a proof that we cannot take prophet's grave as wasila abbas radhiyallahu anhu's narration is the proof that we cannot take the grave of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as wasila imam alusi further said there is no doubt that istighatha seeking help in the times of difficulties from people of graves is a matter that is obligatory to be avoided and it is not suitable for the people of intelligence to do that and it should not deceive you that seeker of help can have his need fulfilled and his asking being granted because this is the test and trial from him allah azza wa jal and shaitan can take appearance of the one whose help was sought and people can think that it is a karamat from the invoked far away far away it is the only shaitan who misguides him and deceives him and he makes beautiful his desires this is like shaitan is speaking in idols to misguide their worshipers and the misguided people think that it is from the evolution of the soul of the invoked for help or an angel in the form of the invoked as a karamat for him and this is very bad how they judge end of the words of Imam Al-Lusi So it is clear in Mahmud Al-Lusi's words that there only comes from the Sahaba the saying of Ibn Umar and nothing from any Sahaba seeking intercession from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while they were the best of the people and Umar radhiyallahu anhu turned to Abbas for tawassul meaning requesting him to invoke Allah and he did not go to Prophet's grave nor did invoke Allah with the prophet's status and none of the sahaba objected to this and if istishfa at the grave was legislated then would ever the best people after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prefer to ask abbas instead of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so their absence of objection to umar radhiyallahu anhu shows that they all agreed with him on the fact that there is no intercession at the prophet's grave and the action of an unknown man upon using this silent consensus has no weight there is not a single authentic narration found in the sahaba tabi'in and tabi tabi'in which proves that they used to take wasila of grave hence this narration of majhul person is going against the ijma of sahaba tabi'in and tabi tabi'in point number 3 this narration is against quran and sahih hadith that dead cannot hear with three exceptions and we are going to prove that dead cannot hear inshallah in some time there is one more silly objection which shows the lack of the knowledge and fiqh what is that objection is umar radhiyallahu anhu and sahaba did not object and did not do any nakir and did not reject this man and did not say that you have done shirk the answer to this objection is because that unknown person haven't told umar radhiyallahu anhu that he visited the grave of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam He just told Umar radhiyallahu anhu that he saw Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in dream and he said this and this and he just conveyed the second part of this narration to Umar radhiyallahu anhu if this riwaya was authentic and if that unknown person would have told about visiting grave then Umar radhiyallahu anhu would have definitely done nakir on him and there is no narration found that he told umar radhiyallahu anhu about about visiting grave this narration has two parts visiting the grave of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and seeing prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in in dream so out of these two parts that unknown person has told the second part to umar radhiyallahu anhu and he did not tell the first part that he visited the grave of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but he told him about the dream he saw hence umar radhiyallahu anhu 
did not do any nakir upon him that you have done a shirkiya amal because he is unaware that he visited the grave some people with little int- intelligence and following their desires and trying to spread their disease argue that umar radhiyallahu anhu and malik uddar did not object to the action of this unknown person so it shows their approval of such an action first there is no proof that Umar radiallahu anhu was told about the incident of the istishfa at the grave rather the context shows he was informed about the dream and whoever claims he was also informed about the istishfa at the grave then let him prove this and there is no narration in the world which can prove this that he has informed Umar radiallahu anhu about the istishfa at the grave else it is an empty claim having no validity secondly if we can accept for the sake of an argumentation that umar radhiyallahu anhu was informed about this incident of istishfa at the grave then the silence does not systematically mean approval of such an action especially when this incident proves that seeking intercession from the prophet's grave is not possible rather one should go and seek intercession from a living person so it means umar radhiyallahu anhu approved that seeking intercession at the prophet's grave is falsehood and one should go to living person else he would have refused to ask for rain and would have told the person to go and request this from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as for the silence of malik uddar it is not a religious proof for anybody the action of a tabi'i is not a hujja the scholars and the fuqaha only considered the action of the sahabi to be approved as they might do this because of the hadith yet his silence also shows he agreed that going to a living person is the sunnah and the action of this unknown man is not legislated and this unknown man's request from prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not answered by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam else malik uddar would have objected and said not to ask umar radhiyallahu anhu but prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for rain So this story is against istishfa on graves and not for istishfa on graves. There is a sahih hadith of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam that do not make my grave a place of Eid or a place of gathering which explicitly and clearly is a proof to not to go to the prophet's grave for asking him directly or indirectly. We have seen this hadith before. Okay. Now let's say something about can dead people hear the living people the answer to this question is no as per the quran and sahih hadith dead cannot hear this author of an unknown person also goes against the general formula made by allah that dead people cannot hear the invocation or any other words from living people allah said in the quran اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم انك لا تسمع الموتى surely you do not make the dead to hear surah an-naml 27 verse number 80 the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when a person dies all his deeds come to an end except three as-sadaqah jariya the charity beneficial knowledge which he has left behind or a righteous child who will pray for him this hadith is reported by imam at-tirmidhi hadith number 1376 so all the actions all the connectivity all the amal of a person upon his death disconnects from this world except three amal or three acts which he has done in his life one is sadaqa that means a charity ongoing charity and beneficial knowledge and the righteous child the righteous child who can pray so these three apart from these three there is no connection of the dead person to this world but Allah has created three exceptions in this general ruling of dead cannot hear. First exception is when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam addressed the slain kuffar the disbelievers after the battle of Badr Allah caused them to hear his words although they were at the bottom of the well in which they had been buried this was an special case. Second exception is sending durood salam on prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Allah sends it to him it does not go directly to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so one cannot make it as a proof or dalil that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hears our salam or durood hence dead can hear no this is an exception case and this goes through allah 
Allah sends blessings to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam through angels. Whatever salam, whatever durud, or whatever blessings we sent to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it goes to Allah. Then Allah sends. The third exception is when people goes back after burial of dead. The buried hear the footsteps of the people going back from him. Apart from footsteps, he does not hear anything. These are the special cases when dead can hear. Apart from these, we do not know any text of Quran and Sahih Hadith that dead can hear. Hence, this author is going against the general ruling of the Quran and the Hadith that living people cannot make deceased hear their voice. Now we will see something about the investigation or examination of Hafiz Zubair Ali Zai about this narration. Sheikh Zubair Ali Zai said, Al Amash is a known mudallis. Mudallis is a person who skip one narrator from the chain of the narrations and narrates a narration directly from the top level person for example if we have three people in the narration a b and c c is a mudallis then he will skip b so this is tadlis or mudallis so zubair ali zai proved amash as mudallis one more problem in the hadith that there is a mudallis ravi in hadith Similarly, Imam al-Zahabi has also called him Mudallis in Mizan al-Aitidal, volume 2, page number 224. And further, Imam al-Zahabi said about Tadlis of Amash in Mizan al-Aitidal, except from his shuyukh, from whom he narrates a lot, such as Ibrahim, Ibn Abi Wail, Abu Salih, as saman and the narration from this category is considered as continuous. Yet, this view of al-Zahabi has been rejected by many scholars who weakened the narrations of Amash from Abu Salih as samman and others many mentions with an here are some of them number one Sufyan al thawri he said the hadith of Amash from Abu Salih the Imam is a guarantor I do not consider that he the Amash heard this from Abu Salih reference Muqaddama al Jarah wa Tadil with authentic Isnad Sufyan al thawri rahimahullah said about another narration Sulaiman narrated to us and he al Amash from Abu Salih I do not consider that he heard it from him Sunan al Kubra of Bayhaki Volume 3, page 127 with Hassan Isnad. Point number 2. Al-Hakim Al-Nisaburi. He said about the Hadith, Al-Amash did not hear this Hadith from Abu Saleh. Reference, Ma'arifa Ulum Al-Hadith, page number 35. Number 3. Al-Bayhaki said, the Hadith of Amash did not hear it from Abu Saleh with certitude. Reference, As-Sunan Al-Kubra, volume 1, page 430. Number 4. Hafiz ibn Al-Qattan said about the narration of Amash from Abu Saleh. The narration in Al from Al Amash is presented to show the disconnection because he is a mudallis. Reference Bayanul Waham, volume number 2, page number 435. Number 5. Imam Al Tahawi in a narration of Al Amash from Abu Saleh quoted some objections on the Tadlis and then he mentioned a weak isnad that mentions Sima' that Amash heard from Abu Saleh as samman he relied on it. The reference Mushkil al-Athar, volume number 5, page number 435, hadith number 2192. Similarly, we have Imam al-Daraqutni, Imam al-Nawawi, Imam al-Bazzar, Hafid ibn al-Jawzi, and so many other muhaddithin Hafiz Zubair Ali Zai quoted who has done jarah and who has uh, refuted Amash as mudallis. Now one question may arise in our minds that why Hafiz ibn Kathir told this author as sahih? The answer is because Hafiz ibn Kathir rahimahullah has his own principle that if Kibarut Tabi'een are majhul, then also Rivayah is Sahih. Kibarut Tabi'oon means the early generations of Tabi'oon. Other muhaddithin are against this principle of Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, and they did not accept this principle. Okay, now we come to the conclusion of this article. What we conclude about this entire talk. Number one. This unknown man's identity is doubtful and one cannot be sure that he was Bilal ibn al-Harith al-Muzani because Saif is not trustworthy. Second, this author is against the foundation of Tawheed. Number three, this author doesn't prove that the unknown person mentioned to Umar that he visited the grave of Prophet ﷺ. He just mentioned about his dream. Number four, his dream does not have anything against Quran and the Sahaba's Aqidah.
the dream only speaks about to go to Umar and ask him to make dua to Allah and then you will receive rain. His dream is in fact the proof of tawassul of living pious person and this is permissible tawassul. Hence Umar accepted what this majhul man said. Number 5. If he would have told Umar about taking grave of Prophet as wasila, then Umar would have definitely done nakir on him. Number 6. Do Salafis have many issues with Umar verdicts? No. Alhamdulillah. Salafis do adl and justice in deeny understanding. On the contrary, Hanafis do ghulu and exaggeration in mahabba and ikram of Umar and attribute so many matters towards Umar which came either via weak narrations or they are authentic but distorted by Hanafis and attributed to Umar and those matters are not said by Umar not practiced by Umar the most famous examples of such matters is the three talaqs and the 20 rakah tarawi. These are wrongly attributed to Umar So we can say Hanafis do ghulu in the ikram of Sahaba Karam and accept anything whatever comes to them with the name of Sahabi. Especially Umar They do ghulu in the love of Umar Point number seven, we found that out of five conditions of hadith to be authentic, this narration of Malikuddar is hampered somehow or the other in all the five conditions of siha of hadith. Number eight, Sufis have a principle that to prove a matter of aqidah, we have to have a mutawatir hadith and not a had. Since we are agreed that tawassul through a dead is a matter of aqidah, and this rivaya of Malikuddar is ahad. So why are, you, why are you changing your principle now and accepting ahad rivaya to prove aqidah? Number nine, if for the sake of argument we consider this rivaya sahih and if istighatha through qabr was sahih in Islam, then why Prophet ﷺ told him to go to Umar and ask him to ask Allah for rain and be clever? Prophet ﷺ should have accepted his istighatha and rain should have started, but it did not happen. Rather, Prophet showed him a shara'i way for istisqa. Number ten, some people say that it doesn't matter. If Hafid ibn Hajar did not provide chain of the narrators, Allah Akbar, subhanallah. People are ready to accept a narration without a chain if that narration is proving their wrong aqidah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. We have some nasiha for these people who distort the Quran, Hadith and the understanding of Salaf. How people of intelligence can believe this action to be sunnah? And yet, there is no authentic narration about any Sahabi, Tabi'i, followers of Tabi'i, or great Imam doing this. Neither any of the jurists like Imam Malik, Imam al Shafi, Imam ibn Hanbal mentioned this in their books, nor any student of Abu Hanifa. Rahimahullah. While the students of Imam Abu Hanifa have many books recording the verdicts of their Imam, like Kitabul Athar of Muhammad. Ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani and other of him. Ibn al-Qasim has his Mudawanna recording the saying of Imam Malik and there are other students of Imam Malik. Al-Muzani gathered many books of Imam al-Shafi'i and many students of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal gathered his sayings like Abu Dawood, al-Khallal, al-Athram and others. Yet there is nothing about istishfa on the Prophet's grave. Rather we find words of Imam Malik saying not to stand for a long time beside Besides the chamber of the Prophet to send salam and to walk away. In his Muwatta, 
in which Imam Malik gathered the action of the scholars and jurists of Medina and great Tabi'i. He did not mention from any of them any kind of intercession, neither Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib nor any other of great Tabi'is of Medina. And these Tabi'is saw how the Prophet, how the Sahaba would behave beside the grave. Contrary to this, Abdul Razak quoted after the narration of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu that is also in Muwatta about his manner of sending salam beside the chamber. The great Tabi'i Ubaidullah ibn Umar saying, we do not know of any among Sahaba who would do this except Ibn Umar and none of the muhaddith like Al-Bukhari, the author of Sunan, the lowest books, has a chapter about seeking intercession from Prophet's grave. And even mutakhir scholars like an nawawi and others who quote the narration of Utbi and others do not claim this from any of the Sahaba, any of the Salaf, neither from Imam al-Shafi'i nor Ahmad, rahimahullah. Rather, they relied on the fabricated hadith of Al-Utbi. So this shows consensus of Sahaba, Tabais, their followers, and of all Imams, jurists, and Muhaddith of the Salaf about not doing this. And this is the way of the believers, the Jama'ah, that one should not oppose and they constitute the majority of the scholars of this community. And finally, as we always do, we will say a word of balancing the things in Islam to those who imbalance the things in Islam in the way of Allah. Allah said in the Quran, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ أَتَسْتَبْدِلُونَ الَّذِي هُوَ أَدْنَى بِالَّذِي هُوَ خَيْرِ Would you prefer to accept what is lower and would you prefer to leave what is greater? This is a great verse from the Quran who teaches us to balance the things in Islam or to take which is having more weight in Mizan on the scale and to leave the things which are lighter in the weight which do not have any kind of weightage in Islam. We have to leave those matters. May Allah guide us all to the correct understanding of deen. Wallahu ta'ala alam bis sawab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.